Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, 25th anniversary of the Neurological Foundation Brain Bank. Uh, my name is Barry Snow. I'm a neurologist. I trained here at Auckland Medical School, trained by Richard Fall, who we're going to hear speak in a little while. Uh, I work across at Auckland Hospital. And uh, for a number of years now, I've been on the Foundation uh, Council and I've been the chair of the Neurological Foundation for the last couple of years. And so I'm really pleased to welcome you all here tonight. Now, I just want to make a few observations to put this evening into context. And uh, I'm going to start out by talking about heart attacks, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, in the last 50 years, the chance of us dying suddenly of a heart attack has reduced 90%, <clears throat> which is a miracle of modern medicine. Our grandparents were suddenly made widows or wid widowers, and it was sudden loss in the family was the standard thing. Now, between then and now, a miracle has occurred, that 90% reduction in the in death of heart attacks. But it's got a couple of important lessons for us in the world of neurology. The first is a kind of a tragic lesson, because people don't live forever, and no, we're no longer dying of heart attacks. We're no longer suddenly made widows or widowers. We're now developing neurologic disease instead. For New Zealanders or countries like New Zealand, if you're a woman now, you've got a one in two chance of having a stroke, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> if you're a man, there's a one in three chance. So instead of being a widow or widower, you become either a person with a chronic disease or you become a carer. And so this is the change that's happened in our society. The second story that comes from this heart attack story, though, is a much more encouraging one. This 90% reduction in death has come from research. It's come from a long haul research. And the reduction is about half of it is in lifestyle. And the lifestyle is about smoking, exercise, blood pressure, and all those sorts of things. And that's about public awareness. <coughs> the other half is from just modern, hardcore medical improvements in science. And that's all come from research. So the cardiologists have had their day and it's time for neurology. Because <laughs> we've got a big problem now. If you're not going to die of a heart attack, we're going to die of something else. And if it's neurological, we need that same 90% cure. And that's what the Neurological Foundation is here for. It's here for those two things. It's for research and it's for awareness. We need to understand better the cause and cures of these brain diseases. And we need to allow the public to know that. And our charter is to promote research and promote awareness in the community. And we do that with evenings like tonight, where we give you a chance to meet and talk with the researchers and family members who are affected by neurologic disease. Now, it took 50 years for the cardiologist to do that. And that's a piece of muscle with four holes in it and a couple of arteries. <laughs> the brain is so much more complicated, but it's the same story. It's a story of long, consistent, playing out research. The Neurological Foundation has been through some radical changes in the last couple of years, and, and we've, we've really re reassigned what we're trying to do. And in particular, we've got a value set, and they include two important values. One of these is stewardship, and the other is sustainability. <clears throat> when we talk about stewardship, we're very aware that many of you in the audience uh, donate money to the Foundation to support the research and awareness. And, and our view is that it's not our money, it's your money, and we're stewards of your money to make sure it goes into the right place. The other is sustainability. Our vision is that we're going to be doing this in 50 years' time. It took 50 years for the heart doctors, it'll take us 50 years. We came up with the 50 years because we recognise that if we help a young neuroscientist train into a mature neuroscientist doing the good deeds that you want done, that takes about 25 years, and we then want them to train another neuroscientist to carry on for another 25 years. And 25 and 25, I'll leave you to do the maths. <laughs> now, the story I've just told you is very relevant for tonight's story because 25 years ago, the Neurological Foundation uh, with, with uh, Sir Richard uh, bought a deep freezer to start out the Neurological Foundation uh, brain bank, which Richard has been the steward of ever since. And Richard has really created a a uh, facility here which is unique in the world and because a large part of it is his relationship with the families, recognising that he and the brain bank are actually stewards of the family's donation to science 
because it's the family who wants the answer. So there's no sense of owning those brains. Richard is the steward, and I'm sure he'll talk to you much more about that. And the other thing about the brain bank is that sustainability, that same thing. So when you put tissue at minus how many degrees? Minus 80 degrees, it pretty much lasts forever. And, and parts of those brains have been researched now, even 25 years on. So it's, it's a great and parallel story. The other parallel story with the sort of vision of the Neurological Foundation is that we have two people here who the Foundation has been just so happy to support over the years, for 25 years. And now Morris, the next one to lift up the flag for the next 25 years, we hope. So as you can see, there's parallels all the way through. So tonight, we're going to be hearing about the history of the brain bank, about where it's taken us, and then Richard will talk us through that and the overall vision. And then we're going to have Morris speaking next, who um, will tell us about some of the really cutting edge science that he's done here and overseas, because it's very much an international story. And then we've got Mary Heron here, who uh, has a very strong personal and family connection with Huntington's disease, which is one of the diseases we'll be talking tonight, to help you understand the human element of all the science we're doing. So I'm really looking forward to hearing these talks. And uh, Richard, I'll get you to come up first. And Well, thank you, Barry. Um, and first, I'd just like to welcome you all here. It's a very special occasion for us because, you see, we're here to celebrate the Brain Bank, 25 years of funding from the Neurological Foundation, which is incredible. But we're here because, in fact, the families were the drivers to start the Brain Bank in the most incredible way. And the history of the Brain Bank, going right back to the beginning, it's virtually the history of my career in brain research here at the University of Auckland, uh, basically around about 40 years. And so I'm just going to take you through a little story. I've only got 10 minutes, and you realise it's a pretty big challenge for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I will absolutely do my best and um, try and give you the background of, of how, the, how the brain bank started driven by families, then how we actually, how we process the brains in a very in an overall way and talk about some of the staff involved and then give you two or three quick exciting glimpses of some of the most exciting discoveries we've had over the years. So, Diana and I arrived back in Auckland here from the United States after doing postdoctoral studies there and I had a position in the anatomy department, and I came back full of all the latest findings on how to trace pathways in the brain. And of course, you did research on rat brains, you see, this little rat brain here. And so I was sitting up in my lab in the anatomy department, the only person in the medical school doing brain research then, had to start the, the lab virtually from scratch. And um, I was interested particularly in the basal ganglia, which I specialised in the United States at Harvard and MIT and in San Francisco. And so the basal ganglia lie deep in the brain, you see. And so that's, that's what I was studying. And um, these are the areas of the brain which are involved in Parkinson's and Huntington's disease in particular. And um, so in 1980, a transformational thing happened. I had a visitor, Professor Arthur Veal. He was a professor of genetics. And he came to see me and he said, Richard, you know, he actually taught me genetics and actually came from Taranaki, so he had a lot of things in, you know, going for him. And <laughs> uh, he said, um, Richard, you're studying the basal ganglia. I said, he said, well, I look after all these Huntington's families in New Zealand, 400 families with Huntington's disease. I'm the professor of genetics and it's really important that, that we do as much as we can for them because although we know it's, this disease is driven by a dominant gene... We don't know anything about that gene. We can't test for it. We, we, we don't know even what chromosome it's on. We didn't find that out until much later in 1993, you see. So he said, the families want to know. They have been given a diagnosis. The Huntington's in the family. And um, it's a clinical diagnosis made on the symptom profile. Um, 
and there's always some doubt as to whether it may actually be precise, and they, they would like you to look, if you would, at the brain of their mum and dad when they died to see if the dominant genetic disease was in the family, because if, if they did die of Huntington's, then, of course, each child has a 50% chance of getting it, and it's a death sentence in the long term. So um, I said, would you look at the brain? And I said, absolutely. And, and so, you see, we, he would come along and every three months or so, the first brain we received was in April 1981. And what we were looking at for was to see, this is a section through the normal brain, and this is a section through a person who died with advanced Huntington's, where this basal ganglia area, which I was specialised in, this atrophies and dies in this is a very specific way in Huntington's disease. And when you look under the microscope and see the pattern of cell death and all the rest of it, you can say categorically, yes, this person did have Huntington's disease. So I teamed up the neuropathologist, Dr. Beth Sinek, and um, she was an incredible mentor for me. And together we would examine the brain, take slides, stain them up, and we'd give the feedback to the family. We'd ring the family up and tell them. We'd write them a letter. We'd send them a very special certificate that Arthur put together saying thank you for the support you've given to this research program because what the families did, which was the most incredible thing, in most cases you see it was yes, you do have Huntington's in the family, but now and again it was a no. Not often, unfortunately. But they were just so grateful for what we had done for them. They said keep the brain and do research on it and see if you can stop these cells dying to help our children. And I thought, what a marvellous idea. So I moved from the rat brain to the human brain. And that was going to shape the rest of my life and the rest of our whole research programme. And so over the years, in the first year, 1981, we, had, we received three brains from families in different parts of the country, fed the information back, and then... Um, and as it went on, we, we actually spread and looked at other diseases. But the important thing was, we found that when we looked at the brain of the people with Huntington's, there's a lot of variation between the pathology. And it was important, we, we, this puzzled us. They, the cells didn't die in the same pattern. And so we thought, well, perhaps we need to get the history of what the symptoms of this person had during life. And so we then went back to the families to get more information. The families loved it because they become partners in our research, you see. And so over a period of 10 years or so, we began, we received brains from all over New Zealand, all different places. It's just a brief outline. And, and um, what was interesting, they endorsed our research program and we put together special donor packages which facilitated and got consent and all the rest of it so they would understand what we were doing. They gave their permission in a formal way. And then we found that by going back to the families, getting this additional information made our research so much more useful. We could suddenly look and understand the variation in the pattern of cell death and related the symptoms. And, the, and we had specialists who went out to do that. We, had, we got psychologists to join us. And I think Virginia Hogg is here. Virginia, can you just stand up briefly? So Virginia Hogg is one of the psychologists, part of a whole team, who's supported us over the years, who's gone back and been our liaison with the families. And that made our brain bank very special. We also went to the doctors, talked to the neurologists, the people who had looked after that person during life and got the clinical history. And the families were very happy to give permission to do that. And so we not only received this fantastic gift from the family, you know, it's the most invaluable gift you can give to science. It's the, the brain of the mum and dad is special. It's not a kidney. It's, a, it's, it's something which is your mum and dad, you see. And we always committed ourselves to treating the tissue with respect, with dignity. And I said, told them, we are just the custodians. The, the brain is, always belongs to the family. So you see, the family were driving the establishment of what ultimately would become our brain bank. 
And so in a way, we were developing quite a unique partnership, looking back now. It was a partnership between families, with clinicians, doctors, neurologists, neurosurgeons, and with researchers. And gradually we spread, uh, we moved from Huntington's and also started moving into Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is an interesting disease of the basal ganglia. Huntington's causes cells to die in what we call the striatum. Parkinson's causes cells to die in another part, the substantia nigra, and they're sort of reciprocal diseases from that respect. So from the research point of view, that was so interesting for the and for advancing understanding on these neurogenic diseases, it was, became so vital. And then moving to Alzheimer's disease, doing the same sort of thing, keeping contact with family, um, and, um, and, just, and, and then finding that we needed to get more people involved with the research, not only doing the chemical studies, the cell studies, but also pharmacologists, Mike Dragunov's here tonight. He's been a partner in this, and others looking at the genetics, Russell Snell's group, and all the rest of it. So we, you see, it grew. It grew in the most amazing way and um, um, the most exciting way. And then as the years progressed, we went into the motor neuron disease, MS, and then glioblastoma tumours with the neurosurgeon. So as when they do operations in the hospital now, they take out small pieces of tissue of, of tumours, and often actually large pieces, and we always get a sample which comes straight across the road into our labs for research with the patients and families' consent. And that is marvellous. Um, by working with the community and with families, you stay humble. By giving them hope, and, and what was really important was to go out and report back to them. Go out to the Huntington's Associates, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and go out to the meetings and tell them where our research was going, sending our graduate students out. You see, going back out, and I call that giving back saying thank you for the gift, we're coming back to report to you where we are and where the hope is for the future. And that creates an ethos in research which is based on top scientific research but with connections to the community where the people were actually suffered by the disease. All the different associations have been absolutely critical supporting this program. And so in the small country, I say in the small country you can do this sort of thing. They can't do this in the United States. So being small is sometimes being better and doing research in a way, engaging with the community is something fantastic. What is the brain? Well, this is the brain. This is our, in, in 2009, we actually moved to new facilities up on the fifth floor. The school had been remodeled, and they created new labs, and they said, because you, you, you brain scientists and neuroscientists are working together, we're going to give you the top floor. How appropriate. <laughs> How appropriate, you know, the brain's at the top of the head, we're on the top floor, and, and we had a... Up until then, you see, the brain bank was actually a group of freezers in the corridor in the anatomy department, and we couldn't put a label over it because it didn't seem right with students going off into the labs and so on. Past, and, but now we had a facility which was a Rolls-Royce facility for, for a, a Rolls-Royce unit, and you see, in the Centre of Brain Research here, we've got... Um, some of our staff, that's Henry Waldvogel, he's our senior research fellow, he's not here, he's actually in, in uh, overseas at the moment, just been at the conference. He is supported by the Douglas Charitable Trust. And Jeff Douglas is here tonight, thank you Jeff for what you do, and, and Henry is, is, a, is a cornerstone of helping us process the brains. There's Morris there, and there's myself there, I'm pretty young looking, and, and this is... <laughs> And this is Jocelyn. This was pictures taken from, uh, I think, probably 2011 or something. And Jocelyn was our brain bank manager up until 2012. In the early years, right through. Jocelyn, can you just stand up? And so thank you for what you have done in establishing the brain bank. <laughs> Jocelyn left in 2012 to travel the world. She's having a great time running out of countries in Africa, I think. Um, and then the next brain bank manager was, was Marika. And Marika's here. And um, stand up, Marika. You... <laughs> and this is us here just about to start dissecting a brain, you see. And uh, so just to give you a hint, because I've only got 10 minutes, probably more than half a day. <laughs> <laughs> when we... So we set out, because we were anatomists, we were absolutely particular that we actually 
would carefully document every little block of brain we got out, and it follows the pattern of the folds in the brain and the function of the areas. They're all given numbers. This is inferior frontal gyrus here, IFG, and that's block zero, one, and two. So you label each block of tissue you take out, wrap it up, and put it in the freezer, you see? And so you can imagine, this, this is a meticulous process, so I'm just giving you a very general overview. The, the brains have to be put through special. Um, in some cases, we perfuse one half of the hemisphere and keep the other half fresh, but they're all blocked down in this very special way, and it takes a couple of hours, two or three hours at least, just to do this part of it, and then we go into the other side, turn that hemisphere around, and we take further blocks, all carefully documented in a way which is, and right down the brainstem, in a way which is unequal, I would like to say internationally. And so we get 60 blocks from one side of the brain, 60 blocks from the other side of the brain, it's about 120 blocks per brain. We have tissue in the brain bank from 100, from 1,000 brains. 700 whole brains which have been dissected in this way, and the other 300 brains which is just tissue which has been come really off the neurosurgery um, operations where they've taken out bits of tumour or taken neurosection for epilepsy. So put that all together, you see, and we've got 45,000 blocks of the most precious brain tissue in the world where we've got the documented clinical history and we in contact with the families. And this came from small beginnings... But the, and it grew. If someone had said to me when I first started here in 1978, your job over the next 10, 15, 20 years was to establish a human brain back, I would run a mile. So it happened, and it happened because families came to us and told us that we need to do research, not on the rat brain, but on the human brain. We need, we need to do animal studies, it's really important. But to understand any brain disease, you've got to look at the ultimate, I call it the ultimate model, the Rolls-Royce, the human brain. Because if you don't know what's going on in the human brain, you won't know how to model it, you see, in the animal brain. So, you see, that's incredible. What I'd just like to do is pause here for a moment now, and I've asked, you know, processing these brains takes a huge amount of effort. We've got the staff. Marika, can you stand up again? Uh, Jocelyn, stand up again. We, and we've got two new brain bank technicians which have started, um, funded by the Neurological Foundation, a new five-year grant. There's Remai and um, Celine. You are here somewhere? Yep. Stand up. <laughs> but in addition, helping these people are our graduate students. When we get a brain, we have to pull in all the expertise, and our graduate students doing PhDs or doing postdocs, they have to come and help also. And can you all stand up, all the ones who are here tonight? There's only a sample of them. All of you, come on, come on, up the back, up along the... So these people, you see, are brought in to help process the brain tissue. And by doing it, and they're all doing research on the human brain, by doing it, they gain respect for what's required in processing tissue. They go out and talk to the families too, and they go out and give reports back. And so we, we, we have ended up with a little army of brain scientists and researchers across the university who are studying the human brain, which has made us a unique facility. Um, and um, so and I just happen to be the... A member, the team leader, if you like, but I'm not really, I don't lead, I just, I just facilitate and help them and, and give them an opportunity which will stay with them forever and make them scientists that when they go overseas, they get jobs easy because there's not many PhD students who do their PhD on the human brain or postdocs who travel and they, they go over and, and they, they produce an impact in overseas labs before they come back to New Zealand. So, you see, in the most humble way, our research is a partnership with the community. Patients and families, right in the middle, brain scientists and doctors. What's, ex what's interesting is that from these studies, we have had the most exciting, unexpected findings on the human brain. I'm just going to briefly show you, and it's going to be brief, three little examples. <laughs> so, Morris Curtis was a PhD student with us to the and then went off to the postdoctoral studies in, you know, in, in Sweden, and then other PhD students were working in association with them. And we found, they found, 
The first evidence that the human brain has adult stem cells in it which multiply throughout life and make new brain cells. And that's the pathway going down here which we showed in the human brain. And that was revolutionary. And that changed our concept, our thinking, on the whole concept that the human brain can make new brain cells forever. When I was brought up as a medical student, when you got 25, that was it for your life. That was wrong. And so that was published in a top journal science. So congratulations, you guy. That was, that was fantastic. That put us on the map. Another finding we had, I had about 10 PhD students looking in Huntington's in particular, and we were looked at all the various parts of the brain, the basal ganglia deep inside the brain, and the, um, you know, you go right way here, and looking at the cortical areas, the different parts of the cortex which do different particular functions, and we found something really interesting. We found first that there were cell, the cells were dying not just in the basal ganglia deep in the brain, but also in the cortex. That was quite new in Huntington's disease. But we also found the pattern of the cell death varied from one area to the other. And patients with mainly motor symptoms, where especially the motor area involved and other adjacent re regions involved with motor functions, whereas in cases which had mainly mood symptoms, these areas were not affected, but other areas were affected which, which were involved with the analysis of mood. So by, by taking that finding, we could confirm and work out the function of the different parts of the cortex, you see. But it was a totally new finding which turned our understanding of the pathology of Huntington's on its head. And one of the most recent findings, so we published about five papers there over the last 15 years. The most recent one was we published on the cerebellum, this part at the back of the brain, which everyone said was not affected in Huntington's disease. Well, put Dr. Malvinda Singh Baines on. She's over here somewhere. Stand up, Malvinda. She... So Malvinda showed that in comparison with the normal, these are these beautiful cells in the normal cerebellum, these big Purkinje cells discovered in, in 1837 by Purkinje, and they're the biggest cells in the brain. In cases of Huntington's disease, we found that in cases with mainly mood, there was no change in the actual numbers of cells, but in those with motor symptoms, a 30% reduction. And that has just been published literally in January of this year in one of the top neurology journals. And that has changed our understanding of the disease and means it's a much more broad disease because it's a better scientific understanding and takes us into a whole new era. And we have made an impact on the world stage because of that. And finally, because we get the brain soon after death, because the families know we need to have the brain tissue quickly, then we can take biopsies, or little samples of that <coughs> tissue. And this is Mike Dragonoff. Mike, stand up. <laughs> so Mike, you see, Mike Dragonoff had this vision of we could take these pieces of tissue, dice them up, and actually he used to work on cell culture, but now he's seen the light, he's working on the human brain, and um, digest that tissue down into the single cells and then keep it alive and we could show that normal human brain cells are like this and ones from brains of people with epilepsy which got off the neurosurgery surgery receptions look like that, that cells are different, they have different characteristics and we can therefore use these cultures of just these cells in a dish in the lab to test new drugs. And we're just embarking on that. We can not only do this epilepsy with Alzheimer's, Huntington's, with, with gliomas, with cancers of the brain. And that puts us in front of everyone else. And that is just marvellous. So this is because families believed in us, you see, and gave us this incredible opportunity. But finally, you see, our brain bank is so special because of what we know about all the tissue we have, because we have contacts with the families and overseas groups who are world experts in the area, mainly studying doing animal studies, and want to try and see what's happening in the human brain. With the family's consent, we send small amounts of tissue to them. We only, we only collaborate with the very best groups in the world, and they, they're doing things that we can't do. And when I ask the families, you know, are you happy to do this? 
Every case they are so enthusiastic, they're saying, you know, mum's getting the travel and death they shouldn't have in life. And we're, we're changing the whole face of neuroscience forever. So these are just the groups which are in the UK, these are the groups which are in Europe, um, and these are the groups which are in the United States and in Canada. And so, you see, we can collaborate with groups internationally. Some of the groups, that, the, the, the top class groups, they will collaborate with us, but actually they won't collaborate with each other because they're so competitive. <laughs> but they are very happy to collaborate with New Zealanders, and we, so we lie at the intersection, you see, and we can spread and become involved with top research groups overseas, exchange students and so on, and it's marvellous. So, you know, you can make a big wave. You may be a small country, but you can make a big wave. And so this is how you do world-class research with family support. The Human Brain Bank, which is a neurological foundation, has supported for us right from 1994. In the early years, we got a small grant for three years, and then as the years have gone by, it's built up. And that's been marvellous. So and now we've got a five-year grant going for the next five years. We've got our additional staff. We've got additional resources. We can now have a vision for the future. And so thank you, Neurological Foundation. Thank you for the Douglas Charitable Trust. Thank you also for other agencies here tonight, like the Freemasons, who have supported the Brain Mac in all different ways. So it's been a marvellous journey. And the journey is only just beginning, really. We're now going into top gear for the next 25 years. So thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Richard. Uh, Richard used to teach us at medical school, and I remember just being amazed how much enthusiasm he had, particularly for somebody so old. And I realise now that was, <laughs> but I realise now that was 35 years ago. So <laughs> doesn't look any older to me now. So, um, so a, a theme of this brain bank, in, in case you hadn't noticed yet, that this is really is an international brain bank. Uh, it's respected all around the world, and it collaborates all around the world. And tonight we've got a couple of videos uh, uh, now, and then after Morris speaks, uh, from some international collaborators. The first is uh, Jean-Paul uh, von Sattel, who from the New York Brain Bank. Uh, we'll just, and, then, and then after that, Morris is going to speak. And that way I don't have to jump up and down all the time. So Morris is the deputy director of the Brain Bank. Uh, he trained here, but then he... Um, uh, did his postdoctoral work in Sweden where you saw some of the work he did. And, and he, I'm not sure much how he's going to show off, but I'm going to show off on his behalf. Um, it, it was really was understood that we only had a certain number of cells in the brain which, when they died, were gone. There's no concept that they could renew themselves. And the work that Morris did sort of changed the, helped change the world of neurology to understand that the brain does have reparative mechanisms. And it goes part of the way to help us understand why good brain health, the stuff that we encourage you to do, like your exercise and not smoking and don't get head injuries, gives a chance, the, the brain a chance to recover from insults. So it really is leading stuff. So we're going to hear from Jean-Paul and then I'll leave Morris to speak. Yep. I am Jean-Paul Fonsatel, professor of neuropathology and one of the founders of the New York Brain Bank, uh, which took place in 2001 at Columbia University of New York. I am currently acting as the co-director and helping during the transition involving the new leadership. I have 40 years long experience in brain banking, thus it is in that capacity that uh, I am uh, especially aware of the tremendous contribution of the New Zealand Neurological Institute, uh, Foundation Human Brain Bank, to neuroscience. In particular, I am blessed to know and I and having been deeply inspired by Sir Richard Fall, who is a pioneer in human, in human brain banking and in research dealing with human neurodegenerative diseases. Indeed, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, for example, occur naturally only in humans. Therefore, processing post-mortem brain from clinically well-characterized patients is crucial to unveil the de deleterious mechanism causing the premature death of differentially vulnerable groups of neurons. The call of the center for processing human brain for research is labor-intensive to provide crucial samples to basic scientists in 
investigating neurodegenerative diseases. Thoro clinical data are gathered and correlated with pathological changes to optimize the diagnostic categorization plus the specificity of the pathogenesis of interest. Therefore, made available to researchers, are extensively dissected and carefully harvested human brain samples that are catalogued and safety, safely stored until specifically retrieved and dispersed to eligible research, researchers. Thanks to the New Zealand Centre, the Brain, brain research, research, major discovery were made notably with regard to the pathogenesis of Huntington's disease among, among others. Generated were novel data on the characterization of proteins, on protein interactions, on cortical neuronal changes. Carefully documented were the loss of cortical interneurons, the mapping of region specific interneuronal degeneration, and data on the rostral migration stream. What was achieved during the past 25 years of activities of the New Zealand. Center for Brain Research is outstanding and has greatly influenced the, and continues to influence the scientific community worldwide. Thank you, thank you uh, and above all, congratulations. Um, you might be interested to know that uh, if a pathologist ever makes a, uh, a diagnosis of Huntington's disease, they will also assign a von Sattel grading. And that was because of the work of Jean-Paul von Sattel uh, in the 1980s. Um, just before I start, I'd like to just say thank you um, to those of you who are here because you've donated the brain of a loved one uh, or because you've been involved uh, in the donation side of uh, the brain bank. I've met a number of people here uh, who are, and I'd just like to say thank you because the work that I'm going to show you and the work that uh, we will do in future years is because of your generosity. Um, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about where I think uh, neuroscience research is going. Um, and so I'm not going to focus too heavily on our own results, um, but just to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the major areas that uh, different countries around the world are actually focusing on. Now, I've only got a few minutes, so I'll keep it brief, but um, I'll start by talking a little bit about um, our, our work, tell you a little bit about some work going on overseas, and then tell you a few of the directions that the Brain Bank will take over the coming years. Now, uh, Richard's already mentioned uh, the fact that the rostral migratory stream, or this pathway for the motorway, as we call it, uh, heads down here towards the olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulb is the area of the brain that allows us the sense of smell. So you're constantly bathing the olfactory bulb in oxygen, which carries odorants and allows you the sense of smell. So park that bit of information for just a moment, and uh, we'll add a few layers here. Now, if you go to the doctor and they give you a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, then the two major areas that you would be thinking would have uh, problems would be the temporal lobe here, which is, acts kind of like the gateway to memory, and then the frontal lobe, which controls your personality and does a lot of memory storage. And if you went to the doctor and got a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, it would be because this area here called the substantia nigra would have lost about 80% of its neurons and therefore would be dysfunctional. And the substantia nigra is involved in controlling uh, your sense of reward, some of your thinking uh, behaviours, and also your ability to generate movements. Now, what's interesting is that if you've uh, already lost 80% of your neurons there, then recovering those is going to be challenging. But I think one of the uh, interesting areas is that if you look in the olfactory bulb, in both of these diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, six to 10 years before someone goes to the doctor with a movement disorder or with a memory loss, they will already have experienced degeneration of the brain and the accumulation of the abnormal proteins you expect to see in those diseases in the olfactory bulb. So the olfactory bulb, and they will have lost their sense of smell to some degree or another. Um, now that's a very consistent finding. It's not just in some people, it's in most people uh, that go on to develop Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. 
So what this says is that there's an area here in the brain, one of the only areas of the brain that's directly exposed to the outside world. Uh, if there's something in the air, um, you can breathe it in, and it will touch the brain really only through the olfactory system, which might also mean if there was an environmental toxin or you have too many of a particular bacteria in your nose or something like that, there's a very easy route of entry for something to get into the brain. Now, that's interesting because uh, Barry mentioned to begin with about heart attacks. Well, if you have a heart attack, you have a very short time to get to the doctor to get treatment. Uh, in the case of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, there's a long window, as it were, a big window into the brain, uh, if we could find out ways to potentially treat this system early. So one of the uh, interesting things, though, is if we look at the olfactory bulb in humans, it's actually quite small, makes up about 0.0064% of the brain weight, uh, compared to the sheep uh, brain, which has about roughly 20% of its brain weight given over to the olfactory system, and the rat brain's about the same. So we have quite a small olfactory system in humans compared to these other species. Now, one of the challenges here is that when you look at a textbook, you'll find a picture that looks something like this. Uh, but actually, almost all of the information that sits in this diagram is directly translated from the mouse brain. So 100 years' worth of mouse brain research has told us a lot about the mouse brain. But actually, there are some fundamental differences that just simply aren't how it is uh, in the human brain. And so even today, you'll see diagrams like this in the textbook. Um, and uh, the first one that I teach to medical students is actually an incorrect diagram, just to show how much this is translated through. And it really highlights the importance of actually understanding the human brain uh, if you want to understand some of these human diseases, because uh, these diseases don't show up naturally, at least in rodents. So one of the things that we've been uh, very involved with is to actually understand this olfactory system and uh, one of the, the things, and I'll just show you uh, one, of, one example of a study that we've done, uh, and I'll leave the detail out, um, is to actually look at the functional units of olfaction and to see how much they are in fact similar in humans uh, in normal and Parkinson's disease compared to what we might see in a rodent brain. So uh, there's a couple of uh, fantastic scientists in the audience tonight, uh, Cheryl Tan and Victor Derricks, who have been involved with uh, the study. And what they've essentially done is take about 300 sections through the human olfactory bulb, stain them with markers that allow us to identify key proteins of interest, and then to reconstruct it so that we can identify where these functional units are. So what the textbooks tell us should happen is the olfactory bulb should be homogeneously distributed with these functional units, the red functional units here. They should be roughly speaking the same on the top of the olfactory bulb as there is underneath. Uh, all of these functional units should be perfectly spherical um, with no gaps, like you can see here. Well, actually, what you can see is that the uh, human brain has all sorts of different sized functional units. The top has uh, far fewer glomeruli than the bottom. And in fact, when you compare this with Parkinson's disease olfactory bulbs, what you find in Parkinson's disease is a reduction to about half the number of functional units compared to uh, normal you also find that almost all of the loss happens from the undersurface of the bulb, the far away surface of the olfactory bulb, which is the area most directly exposed to the outside environment. So these are the types of things that require very special tissue preservation. It requires some, uh, some clever ways of working that many brain banks wouldn't. Um, but uh, this is what we can do because we are research-led. We are able to change the way that we process tissue to match what we think are the most the next most exciting uh, and most relevant projects for understanding not just the human brain, but also uh, diseases like Parkinson's disease. Now, this next set of uh, images that you're going to see, it's, it's a couple of minutes of video, and this is uh, from something called the Blue Brain Project. Now, this is a project that's going on in Switzerland as we speak. It's been going on for 12 years, and the object of this uh, project is to understand the brain in its entirety. That's not a bad uh, uh, thing to start with. I just want to understand the brain in its entirety. Now, what they started out by doing was to try and understand what one two millimetre deep by 0.5 of a millimetre wide piece of cortex from the mouse brain contained. So that, just so you know, is a piece that's that size. 
in a mouse brain, which is much bigger than that little tiny white dot there, I measured it so it's accurate, uh, in order to understand what goes on in a brain that's actually that size. So we've got a long way to go, but what this particular group has done, and it's one of uh, five major national brain projects, so Switzerland has one, China has one, America has one, and uh, uh, Japan has one, and what they've identified from this one single piece of uh, hexagonal tissue, hexagonal so that when they understand that one they can uh, look at another one and add that on, is they've identified 55 different neurons, 20 different spine types or connection methods that the cells use to connect with other cell types. They've identified the connections between the neurons, the glial cells that support the neurons, the oligodendrocytes that wrap up the neurons so that they can conduct efficiently throughout life. They've identified the microglial cells that scavenge and keep an eye on the, the local environment to make sure that it's uh, permissive for neuronal activity. The pericytes that surround the blood vessels um, and fibroblasts that support the brain as well. So over the course of 12 years, they have been able to map, in addition to the physical structure of the brain, they've been able to map also the 100 neurotransmitters, the electrophysiological properties um, that go on in the brain such that they're at the point that in that one single column, they can now, uh, using computers, remove one of those contacts or connections or neurotransmitters and figure out how the brain behavior differs. Now, as you'll see at the end, toward the end of, the, um, of this video, and I'll just speed it up a little bit there, this is just one of these little cubes, two millimeters deep, half um, a millimeter wide in a mouse brain. So what this tells us is that we have a tremendous amount of work to do to actually understand how the brain works. That's, you can look it up online if you'd like to have a look. But the point really is just to get across the complexity of the brain and also to highlight the challenges that we have as a brain bank, which we're, um, we're definitely up for, um, to be able to contribute to projects like this, and we're involved in one of the other national uh, uh, neuroscience um, projects, to be able to make sure that the tissue that we work with, that we preserve, is actually fit for purpose for uh, projects moving forward. So it's an exciting challenge. It's definitely the final frontier, but it gives you a sense of what the challenges are around uh, understanding the brain in its entirety. Uh, I'd just briefly like to touch on our challenges around neuropathology and genetics. One of the challenges that we have, and it's, um, it's a good challenge to have, is that as uh, time goes on, um, our ability to understand how different brains uh, or different brain diseases differ is because we learn so much more and we're able to subclassify diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So within dementia, for instance, there's many subclassifications of dementia. Within Alzheimer's disease, there's subclassifications and so on. And with a, um, a large uh, number of cases, we're able to go back and reclassify um, the cases so that we can best match up the tissue that researchers require with the pathology that they uh, want to actually study. And this is also important because when we look at the, um, the way that we look at genetics, we're also able to uh, do genome sequencing, and we're doing this on some of our cases, to be able to identify how the genetics actually influence the neuropathology. Now this is a pretty big job um, when you can't just go into the brain bank and reclassify the cases every few minutes. You have to be able to do this in a uh, stable, consistent way. And where um, the genetics are very complicated for some of these um, diseases. But I think more and more researchers are asking us for very well-defined, uh, well-classified cases so that they can make sure that the questions they ask um, they can actually get the result that they, that they want to find or that um, it's not because of some genetic variant or some abnormal neuropathology um, that causes that to be so. Finally, I'd just like to touch on one other area that the brain bank is uh, actively uh, moving into, and this is looking at the concept of fresh tissue microarrays. So this is where, rather than using many, many different slides uh, to look at uh, individual brains on, or in, an individual slice of brain on an individual slide, uh, we're actually able to array, in some cases it can be up to 90 pieces of uh, fresh tissue, uh, onto a single glass slide from 
uh, 90 different brains and then do some sort of biochemical assay or something like that uh, on the tissue. We can also look for different proteins, um, et cetera, uh, but on fewer numbers of cases. So in this way, we're working to really make sure that the brain tissue that we have is absolutely fit for purpose for, um, for future studies um, because we want to make sure that, that our brain bank is there uh, when researchers need it for uh, advancing our understanding um, of neuroscience and also neurological diseases. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you very much. Hello, my name is Peter Mombarts. I'm the director of the Max Planck Research Unit for Neurogenetics in Frankfurt, Germany. I'm in Mike Morris in February 2011 in Auckland during the annual conference of the Australian Neuroscience Society, which somehow took place in New Zealand that year. We got along and decided to collaborate. With time, our focus came to the human olfactory bulb and Parkinson's disease. It's believed by many that whatever causes Parkinson's disease enters the brain actually through the nose. And the first part of the brain to suffer damage is or could be the human olfactory bulb. Our first paper was published in the scientific magazine called Brain in late 2017. And we showed there that a particular component of the human olfactory bulb called the glomeruli is reduced by approximately half in cases of Parkinson's disease compared to so-called normal cases or control cases. We are continuing this collaboration with um, many visits to New Zealand and uh, from Kiwis to Frankfurt. In fact, a postdoc who's currently working with Morris, Vicky Lowe, has been twice already this year to my lab in Frankfurt to scan in histological, histological sections of human olfactory mucosa prepared in Auckland. I myself was trained as a medical doctor in my hometown Leuven, Belgium. I never had a practice. I worked my whole life on mice and thanks to the brain bank I have had the special opportunity to work with human brain samples. Uh, needless to say, human brains are hard to get, hard to come by and the Brain Bank in New Zealand is the only one, I believe, that has a special interest in the olfactory system, which is the focus of my lab. I hope for many more years of collaboration, many more visits to New Zealand, to your wonderful country. Um, great job, Maurice, great job. Sir Richard, who started it all. And as one says in uh, New Zealand, good as gold. I'd now like to introduce to you Mary Huron. Um, Mary has a, well, she'll tell you a, a story, a human story about families affected by neurologic disease, a human story about wanting to make a difference, and she'll tell you some of the support that she's done for the brain bank uh, through herself and her family. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm not entirely sure how I've ended up here. The persuasive Richard Fall, really. I'm here to tell you about my family's journey with Huntington's disease, which came, we didn't know about Huntington's until 1990. And I can't believe, looking back on it, how naive we were and how little we knew back then. There wasn't an internet, the gene hadn't been isolated, and there wasn't a Dr Google. So you couldn't get any information, really. I can't believe how little we knew and how much we've learnt in 30 years. And trying to condense 30 years into a few minutes is not easy. Um, our association with the Brain Bank is through Huntington's disease. Our collaboration is from 1991, so it's 10 years after it started, where we donated my father-in-law's brain. Since then, two more brains have been donated from our family. Our whole family is, are brain donors. Um, a question that I'm sometimes asked is, what, how did you come to the decision to donate brains? And if you'll excuse the pun, and I'm sorry, I've been waiting a long time to say this, it was a no-brainer, <laughs> totally a no-brainer. We, fate had dealt us a rather nasty hand with Huntington's disease, and I think we all, even though we never sat down formally and discussed it, we all came to the same conclusion and decided that 
we could turn a negative event into something positive. And by becoming brain donors, then maybe we could in the long term help ourselves and help other people. So that's what we've done. And we're very, very happy with that decision. The association we've had with the Brain Bank has been stunning. I mean, I think it's fair to say that they couldn't do without us but we absolutely would have difficulty coping without their support and help. And the availability of people, I find it amazing that I can email Richard Fall or Morris Curtis and I instantly get a response and get help and assistance. And that's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. You know, I live in Hamilton. I'm, nothing, I'm nobody special, I'm just a family with, who's affected by Huntington's disease. Uh, but we got, I had an instance recently where my eldest son lives in Barcelona, and he's just, as we speak, actually, he's being tested at the moment to see what his status is, to see whether he's symptomatic with Huntington's or not. And I emailed Richard Roxburgh, who I go and see with HD Enroll, or Enroll HD, and Richard emailed Ed Wilde, who's preeminent in Huntington's research in the world, and Ed Wilde emailed back with the name of a contact in Barcelona, and that is the community that I live in in the world. It's really quite amazing. It's huge, but it's small. Um, what else can I say? Excuse me, I've got notes somewhere. So my eldest, my eldest son was um, gene, tested gene positive when he was 19. My youngest son, who happens to be here tonight, he was tested only a couple of years ago. And both of them have Huntington's. They're both symptomatic with it. And they both, and I really, all I can say is that I salute them. They're both brain donors as well. We're all brain donors. And all I can say is that I salute them and their partners. And Christopher, the younger one, um, his partner, Nikki, is here with him tonight. She is utterly amazing. She's supportive and kind and caring of him. And it's lovely for me to see that because it's not an easy path. It's not an easy road they're going to travel. It's... It's, un un it's uncertain. They don't know where they're going to, how it's going to end up. I'm open to any questions. Has anybody got any questions? Oh, thank you. You're rescuing me. Yeah. I think I'd better come and rescue Mary. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> thank you, because it won't download my attachment. Yeah, this is a big thing for a family to, it's huge. to engage sorry. in this process. Yeah. And, and this really illustrates the whole partnership that we have together. So I think mm. we'll excuse... You very, but thank, thank you very you. much for it. So I'm going to wrap up the evening now. Um, the speakers will all kind of work our way to the back and you can intercept them on the way and uh, ask them your questions. Now, I just want to make a final point that this sort of science moves by fits and starts. Uh, Fifteen years ago, we spent some of your money on a Chapman Fellowship on a young neurologist, Alan Barber, and, and he went off to Melbourne and did some uh, world-leading research on stroke. But it was very scientific and didn't make a lot of difference at the time. Ten years ago, we came to you and uh, some big donors and small donors funded a professor's chair of neurology, and Alan was the first neurological ch foundation Professor of Neurology, and he's led us on a journey into new stroke treatments. If you happen to fall down with a stroke now, I can reassure you that you're in one of the three or four best hospitals in the world to have it. Um, so Alan has led us on a journey where we're now uh, extracting clots from patients' brains. We've got a, a tight network across the country. We take patients from as far away as Wellington. We think last year we saved approximately 40 people from a life in a private hospital. Um, we, that's pretty much closing down a private hospital, if you think about that. And, and this is a direct result of the Neurological Foundation using your money to promote academia to make a difference. And we just want to keep doing this again and again. And we think that there's tremendous things that are going to come soon uh, uh, from this body of work that you've heard tonight in the brain bank. And these much more harder diseases, the Alzheimer's, the Huntington's, the Parkinson's, but none of it's random and all of it takes a long time. And I'm just going to finish this evening by thanking the donors so much for the support that you've given to the foundation for <coughs> going back almost 50 years 
now and creating a kind of momentum now that we've seen with stroke, we're seeing with Parkinson's disease, we're seeing with Huntington's disease and it really is uh, the support that you provide the foundation and the partnerships with the families and the affected people that makes all this virtuous cycle go round. So that's the end of our evening tonight. I want to thank all our speakers uh, and I want to thank the <coughs> volunteers tonight. And I also really want to thank the young researchers who've turned up, uh, the ones who were standing up earlier on. Uh, you're the engine that'll drive the next wave and that's why we're so enthusiastic about supporting you. So thank you everybody. <laughs>